Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, there's a lot of uh, equipment under here. Um, so, Governor Brown. Yes. It's <clears throat> great to see you again. You're looking so relaxed and happy. <laughs> um, no, it's my phone. No, oh, oh no, no, it's the microphone. It's the microphone. Oh, the mi I knew something was both <laughs> Are you yes. comfortable? Okay. So the word on the street, and by the street I mean the Omni Las Palmas pool, <laughs> is that you are headed to New Hampshire and Iowa to give some public affairs speeches. Is there anything you want to tell us? No, that's not true. I mean, not that I might not, but it's not in my, <laughs> but it's not in my current thinking. Hmm. Although I do think uh, on the issues that I'm very concerned about, particularly climate change and the uh, escalating uh, new nuclear arms race, I'd like to see that in the presidential debate, and I haven't seen it there yet in any serious way. So I might have to just stir up the pot a bit, uh, not for myself, but for those other 25 people who are aspiring <laughs> to the office. Um, all right, let me throw some numbers at you. Donald Trump is 72, Joe Biden 76, Bernie Sanders is 77, Michael Bloomberg is 76, Elizabeth Warren is 69. So why not get in? The water's fine. You didn't mention Conrad Adenauer. <laughs> Remember how old he was? How about Doug Chowping? <laughs> Both of them were older, and they were quite successful. But that's no reason to, uh, to take rash action. Um, well, I don't think I've ever actually said this sentence out loud in my 30 years of covering politics, but I think you would be a great president, possibly. But yeah, I do. Well. <laughs> no. So, the, <laughs> his, his wife well, first says of, no. First of all, to bring everything down to earth, I don't know. I don't like only God is great. Uh, I'd probably be pretty good, <laughs> but we got a pretty, we got a big field, a lot of serious contenders. And they're often moving. Now, I know more about running for president than most, but not all, but most. And uh, it takes a whole operation. You got to get going, momentum and there are a number of people who are going. I'm on my ranch, I'm uh, observing the world, and at uh, my state in life, I think it's time to take proper care of my wife. Yes. <laughs> well, well, that would be a great platform to run on. Very, yeah. I think women would like that. Yeah. Um, is our clock working? Not that I mind staying, but. No, it's not working. Yeah. Either, um, that, or either that or you stop the clock. Well, yeah, we are going to talk about... Oh, there it goes. We are going to talk about a clock later because <laughs> Governor Brown's main passion is the doomsday clock. And um, uh, I told him we would talk about it for five minutes at the end, and he looked at me with horror and said, fine, you want to give five minutes to the annihilation of civilization? <laughs> I said, okay, well, that, maybe five and a half. No, that's keeping with the media spirit. <laughs> and, and in your training, you have been taught that the end of the world is not news. <laughs> it's not news of the day. It's not even any kind of news. A tweet is news. All sorts of other things are news. So big stuff is outside the parameters of our current contemporary journalism. A lot of people in Washington now think that a tweet could end the world, but... No, it takes, uh, it takes Putin or Trump giving the command, goes directly to the uh, missile launch site, and with them in probably less than an hour, there will be mass annihilation. And yes. there's nothing between Putin or Trump and the firing. So, yeah, that's a real big topic that hopefully our folks in Washington will think about. What in a democracy should be the con constraints uh, on the ability to wreak such, such havoc. Is this really a one-man prerogative, or in a democracy should there be a, a greater and shared responsibility? 
responsibility, which I think they should be. <clears throat> um, I heard that you think that maybe the premier quality necessary for someone in the 2020 race is how they would handle Putin. Well, that, in, in addition to having adequate experience in life. So I think anyone under 75 is suspicious. Yes. To start. <laughs> and I say that from experience because I've had the experience of being the youngest governor in the 20th century, at least in California, and also now the oldest in the country ever. And I can tell you, old has its uh, limits, but uh, you sure learn a lot by being in multiple campaigns, making multiple mistakes, doing all sorts of things, and then having not a year to see the consequence, but to have decades to see the consequences. And that's when you really learn stuff, after the third or fourth decade from what you did way back then. And I think it's good. Now, we have a couple of people like that. You got Biden, uh, who's old and been around, uh, and then you got Pelosi, who is not running, but she's the third finger on the nuclear button, because she's third in line. So, and there may be others. What, I was gonna ask you that, so in the, in the two times you were governor, what do you think you learned about California, and what did Californians learn about you? What did I learn about California? That's For governing. Good, well, I learned you can't run for president from California while you're in office, because it takes you five hours to get it across the country. <laughs> And the sun is already three hours later, and the news starts in, on the East Coast. So um, uh, Reagan, uh, or even Nixon, Nixon uh, had to move uh, to New York to run for president, and Reagan uh, retired, and then he went off on the circuit. So I, I did learn that. Maybe not a profound lesson, uh, but I think California governors uh, need to probably retire if they want to start running. Because when you leave office, this is what, something I did learn. Uh, if you're out of town, then no matter what goes wrong, they say it's because you're out of town. <laughs> it may not be true. In most cases, it was not true. But every time I was in New Hampshire in 1980, something went wrong, then my adversaries in the legislature and other places would say, ah, oh, Brown, we're here <coughs> handling things. Uh, things would have been better. So uh, that's one of the pitfalls. I also learned that if you hear about something called a Mediterranean fruit fly, Spray immediately. <laughs> so I did learn that. Because um, I have a very clear memory of uh, the Secretary of Agriculture uh, coming to me and saying, you know, the, this, these Mediterranean fruit flies, who I'd never heard of before, they're flying around and you're going to have to spray. I said, oh, spraying. The environmentalists won't like that in Santa Clara. So I delayed. And lo and behold, it went away. Because it was in the, uh, December, November, December, something like that. Then all of a sudden, I found out in early March there was something called the spring emergence. <laughs> and within about 30 days, there were so damn many fruit flies that I had to launch a helicopter attack <laughs> that, that looked like Apocalypse Now. <laughs> and, and that was not a good predicate to run for the U.S. Senate against Pete Wilson <laughs> in 1982. So I've learned a lot of things. Um, so some Democrats say it has to be a woman at the top of the ticket. Others insist the Democrats can only win with a white man at the top. What do you think? Uh, I think we can only win with someone with the gravity, the charisma, uh, the seriousness of purpose, and the authenticity to touch the hearts of the American people. Whether that's a man or a woman or a, a general or a governor or a senator, I don't know. Um, and you see it in, the, in these um, primary races or in the early um, parts of these campaigns, people will show up. And you can't always tell. People couldn't always tell about Trump. Uh, they couldn't always tell about John Kennedy. Uh, they couldn't tell, uh, you know, you learn as you go there. So I don't think you can specify a physical or uh, gender uh, set of characteristics. I think human beings come, you can have a, a Golda Meir, uh, you can have a Margaret Thatcher, um, you can have a Donald Trump, you can have a lot of different people. So uh, I think we'll just have to wait and see. But I, I'd say it's not clear yet who's going to be the, uh, uh, the person on the white horse to take us to the promised land. Uh, shortly after Kirsten Gillibrand announced, she was asked at her first presser about the likability factor. 
many people feel it's a dated and sexist question. What do you think about judging women candidates on their likability? I think we're always judging your likability. I think there's something a lot of politicians don't want to admit. But I can tell you, when they throw you out, most times they didn't like you. <laughs> they got tired of you. In fact, I have to, I have to get, because you wouldn't be, if I didn't give you some classical illusion, you wouldn't think you were getting the full treatment here. Uh, but there was a fellow named Aristides. Aristides, they called him Aristides the Just. And this was in Athens, I don't know, in the fourth century or something. They had a, a custom uh, to ostracize certain of the citizens. They did the ostracize, the, they ostracized by putting a, a little pebble, an ostragon, into the box. And um, Aristides the Just were watching people put the pebbles in the, in the box. And there was one lady who put it in, uh, meaning uh, ostracized. Aristides said, why are you doing that? He said, I'm just tired of hearing about Aristides the Just. <laughs> and from that, I have taken the lesson, don't get overexposed. And during the campaign against Meg Whitman, she spent $100 million, a lot of it on television, before uh, I spent my first million. So when I did, which was after Labor Day, so I was coming really late in the campaign, I became the fresh face of California because she was so damn familiar because of the $100 million. So uh, you need likability, but don't overdo it. Um, okay, so that's... Really a great answer. Okay, so Gillibrand made enemies of the Clintons when she said Bill should have resigned over the Monica Lewinsky scandal. Do you think she was right? No. Okay. No, I don't think you should resign. There's too much. That's why we have elections, and uh, things can go wrong. And look, uh, Richard Nixon didn't do the did something different, but he whined at his press conference after he was defeated by my father in 1962, and he said you know, in a very negative, defensive way. You're not going to have a Nixon to, to kick around anymore. Well, it didn't take too many years before he's the President of the United States. So we're all human. We all have errors. Uh, and I think you were raised a Catholic. You learned about original sin and then mortal sin and then confession. So I think uh, I, I don't like to, um, um, first of all, to <laughs> premature kick people out. We have elections. And you either quit if you can't stand it, or if you want to go through it. Some people are pretty clever, and, they can, and Bill Clinton seemed to be pretty clever because he really moved through it. So, yeah, and by the way, he would have never quit anyway, whatever Gillibrand would have told him or not. And she didn't say it at the time, so it's very easy to tell somebody to quit 10 years after they're finished. And what did you think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and what did you think? That's an as if. What, don't we call that a, a hypothetical? What do we call that? No, that's a contrary. That's a, what do they call it, factual oh, yeah. contrary. Fact, uh, contrary to fact, something like that. Right, I know what you Counterfactual. mean. Counterfactual. That's it, it's a right. counter. I knew I was looking for a, a good fancy word. Counterfactual. Gillibrand deals in counterfactuals. <laughs> so no. what do you think, do you think she was right about pushing Al Franken out of the Senate? No. No, he should run for re-election. Um, Okay, so in a story... If you can condemn him, it's all the better. If you really got a good case, then the opponent will braise that up and the guy won't win. In fact, that's why a lot of Democrats wanted him out, because they wanted to make sure they got a Democrat, which they did. So, you know, he can make that judgment himself. But we, I think the election is the sacred uh, judgment. And uh, why not bring... We don't have jury trials for these cases, but we do have elections. Um, in a story last month by our congressional correspondent, Cheryl Stolberg... She wrote that 1976 was a turning point in Nancy Pelosi's life because that's when she got behind your presidential campaign. Pelosi persuaded you to compete in the Maryland Democratic primary, drawing on her ties to her brother and dad, both former Baltimore mayors, and she engineered your victory, which was a big setback for Jimmy Carter. You told the reporter, I had no direct knowledge of anybody or anything in Maryland. It was her idea just to think of that as a bold move. Now Pelosi seems to have found a formula for combating Trump that had eluded Democrats until now. How do you think that's working for her? Great. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, on a former panel, somebody said that Pelosi 
toward Trump regarding the wall was like Joe Welsh having no decency, Senator, with the Joe McCarthy uh, hearing. So I don't know. I never thought of that. Um, but see, Pelosi uh, has a couple of good factors. One, um, she was an early supporter of mine. No, that, <laughs> that, yeah. no, that wasn't. That's not true. I just said that, uh, just to throw you off. Uh, you know, she's had a lot. She's had a lot of elections, had a lot of experience. She's been around, and she's lost, and she's come back. And I think that's um, that's that's that is also if you have the go through the crisis and then come out of it, and you you persevere. Uh, I think that gives her a lot of strength. And uh, dealing with those uh, that Democratic caucus uh, th that tests one's mettle. And I would think she would have a lot of capacity to deal with Mr. Putin and deal with Mr. Chi. And that is the real, that is not the only uh, trait, but certainly given the danger of our world, our president at the very least has to have the ability to uh, be present, to stand up, and to uh, both be open to reasonable accommodation, but to be forceful and insightful and wise in dealing with these two very large uh, individuals in our world. Well, you know, if um, Trump and Pence were to get impeached for any reason, you know. She'd be three. Yeah, she'd be the first female president. Right. So, um, okay, She's, so yeah. you also know Kamala Harris really well yes, from I do. Oakland. I don't she, know really well, well, but I do know her. She succeeded you as Attorney General, and um, is she ready to be president? Well, that's a good question. We're going to find out. She certainly started off with a bang. Uh, and having done it myself three times, uh, she's doing a lot better than I was doing. So, since I thought I was doing pretty good, are you draw your own conclusions. <laughs> are you, are you surprised that there is so much skepticism among black voters about her record as a prosecutor, and among some left-leaning black voters who were ultimately disenchanted by the Obama presidency? Well, I remember uh, Jesse Jackson and other uh, leaders being skeptical of Obama but it didn't stop him. So I, I don't think that's going to be the deciding factor. Have you checked out any of the rest of the 2020 field? Did you see Beto cleaning his teeth no. on Instagram? <laughs> I've never seen Beto. I don't, I don't have a television at the ranch. We have a hard enough time getting the internet. Um, we don't right. have cell phone service. So I guess you didn't see Elizabeth Warren swigging a beer on Instagram. No, I did not see Elizabeth Warren. Did you see Howard Schultz getting heckled at Barnes & Noble for being part of the Davos no. global elite? No, but I hope he's, he's going to put in a charging station at his Williams uh, Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> Williams is where, near where my ranch is. And we just got a hybrid <laughs> car, and when we hook it up to our little solar batteries, it takes 12 hours. So I'm looking for a fast charge at Starbucks. <laughs> so I'm rooting for Howard. <laughs> well, he'll be happy to hear that. Uh, what do you make of this new crop of fiery Democratic freshmen? As a former hellraiser, hellraiser yourself, have you followed the meteoric rise of Alexandra yeah. Ocasio-Cortez? A little is, bit. Is the party being pulled into well, unrealistic... You asked me what I thought. I said, and I will tell you what, I think it too will pass. Which part? <laughs> well, the enthusiasm, the excitement. I've been, you know, I've been a young reformer myself. Yeah. It doesn't last. <laughs> <laughs> but that's all right. There's many incarnations. There's do, many ways. Do you think that she... And the others are pulling the party into unrealistic places? No, I think they're, they're uh, what you call catalysts. So it's you got good. A, you got a pretty, look, politics is very dead in its cliches, its inauthenticity, and its same old, same old. So you need these spark plugs, and it, it will evolve, and other people will react, and then they'll react to that reaction, and that's the way you have a vibrant political process, which I think we are in need of, because it's very stagnant right now. Ever since uh, Donald Trump took over, the Republican Party has turned inside out. They slime the FBI, CIA, and the NFL while they cozy up to Russia and Kanye West. What's <laughs> happening? What is that? What's happened? What, 
I mean, are you surprised to see like the realignment of all the traditional? Well, it is a little surprising, but because Trump has 80% of the Republican voter, and he is the one with the big microphone, the president is news by the, by the rule of the media barons, whatever the president says or tweets, that's news. So the fact that he has all this 80% support, the Republicans have just felt they have to fall in line. And they're scared to death uh, with some uh, reason, I think, because a few senators that bucked him uh, were driven out. Uh, they're, they're all following like sheep. They're all on the program until he does, until something happens that his popularity goes down enough and then one person will step out. And that person could be the next Republican nominee if uh, he has the, he or she has the guts to step out. So I know Gwyneth Paltrow gets all the credit or blame for being in the vanguard of new agey things like meditation and this Who end is? lifestyle. <laughs> Gwyneth. Who? Oh, I missed, I missed the Gwyneth uh, Paltrow. pronoun. What? Gwyneth Paltrow. Gwyneth. <clears throat> She's in Oh yeah, I met her once. <laughs> <laughs> was it during yoga or? No, it was at a birthday party. Remember? Well, she, <laughs> well, you know, Governor Moonbeam was sort of the original goop, which is her company, which has a lot of, you know. So you joked in your 92 campaign that your theme song should be Bad Moonbeam Rising. Bad Moonbeam, that Creedence Clearwater. Yeah. I like that. I know, it was <laughs> funny. I wish I could have come in to Bad Moon Rising. <laughs> Actually, they always have a theme. My other theme was um, On the Eve of Destruction. <laughs> Barry Maguire, you probably, great. Well, I, I first heard that song when I flew down to LA during the Watts riots. And I was driving along Santa Monica Boulevard and these military vehicles were on either side of me and on my radio was playing, or on the eve of destruction. It was 1965, so I have never forgot it. But it's a great song. Um, is it you can play it on the internet, by the way. It's is great. it irritating that the stuff you used to be teased about is now in the mainstream? Why would that be irritating? Is it it's um, self-justifying? <laughs> okay. Now, speaking of music, the first song ever recorded by the legendary punk band The Dead Kennedys in '79 was an ode to you. Do you know this song? The song imagines a future. Yeah, Uber Alice. <laughs> oh, you know, in which you become president and turn America into What was a, the name of that song? It's called, um, oh, what is the name of it? Dead, it's the Dead Kennedys. California Uber Alice. Oh, California Uber Alice, hey, there's, yeah. Okay, California Uber Alice. I yeah. think it was a dumb song, really. <laughs> <laughs> it this doesn't song. make any sense. <laughs> most songs don't, but this, the lyrics here are particularly lame and incoherent. I have some of the but lyrics. But I'm very proud that someone was... <laughs> Thought I had that much power. Yeah, this song imagines a future in which you become president and turn America into a hippie fascist state. <laughs> so some of the lyrics include, I am governor. I can think of worse things, to tell you the truth. <laughs> yeah, I can too. I am Governor Jerry Brown. My aura smiles and never frowns. Soon I will be president. I will command all of you. Your kids will meditate in school. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That By the way, good. where are the dead Kennedys now? <laughs> Nowhere. Um, you know, the other night on our show, Laura Ingraham uh, called for Pope Francis's resignation, uh, saying too little, too late on sexual abuse scandal. And I think Steve Bannon is also an ally in the conservative movement to get rid of the Pope. I just wondered if you, are you still a practicing Catholic or do you pay attention? I thought you were going to ask me about whether I wanted to get rid of the Pope. Yeah, do you well, want I'm, to? I don't meddle in papal politics. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, your beautiful sister Kathleen is here at the festival and told me once that you were always the first kid on the block to take up different hobbies and see around corners. Your mother once told me that even back in the 80s, you were bugging them about putting solar panels in to heat their pool. What are the burdens of being so far ahead of the curve? Well, I don't know how far ahead that is, but it's, um, 
you see, in politics, you have to, if you don't step out far enough, you're nowhere. I mean, you're just another cipher flowing in the crowd. But if you step out too awkwardly or too, uh, too much, too far, mm. Well, then you, you get uh, laughed at or it's not effective. So the problem, in, unlike journalism or acting, politis politics is based on being effective. And you can only be effective if you get other people to go along with you because other people, legislators, Congress, have to vote and you need constituencies. So it, it is a place of creativity, but the creativity has to be linked with uh, foresight and patience and... and uh, strategy, management. So that's the trouble. It's not just being ahead of everybody. You gotta pull people along with you. Um, and I think over time, I've done that. Um, so, you know, Irish Catholic men tend to get married late in life. My dad didn't get married till he was 42, and he had me when he was 61. And I think maybe he was lying about his age, so it might have been even older, but... Um, you got married to Anne later, and everyone's in love with Anne. She's so clever and charming. And That's true. She is clever and charming. And um, I just wonder what about marriage has surprised you? What's the good part and the bad part? What has surprised me? Well, it surprised me it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> every day, every day is a wonder. <clears throat> And then I do almost everything every day together. And um, we were in the same business called running for attorney general. She um, was the campaign, de facto campaign manager and the chief of fundraising and my constant companion. And we had a hell of a lot of t uh, fun, even though there's tremendous stresses. So I think marriage is perfect. I highly recommend it. Had I done it 10 years older, I would be president by now, no question. I, I was going to... I was going to ask you that question. I mean, that's what they said about Nancy Reagan, right? That yeah. Ronald Reagan would be pumping gas at Sunset Boulevard. If <laughs> I doubt that. But <laughs> um, now that we're on family, um, I know these personal questions are not your favorite. I'm trying to think. I remember asking you... Um, I asked you once, <coughs> one of those times you were running for president about you know, the Brown dynasty, and you would say to me, these personal matters are not the stuff of historic change. How much do you know about Mao Zedong's personal life, or Churchill's, or Julius Caesar's? <laughs> Which By the way, on the thing yesterday about Roosevelt and Churchill, nobody ever talked about how drunk he was at the White House. They, they well, they hinted, they hinted at it, but that's one of the extraordinary things that Churchill drank so much and yet was so effective. That's a very interesting personal point. Now, I don't drink as much as Churchill, and I'm not as effective. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, when I interviewed Steve Bannon, he told me he thought Trump was a combination of Charlemagne, Henry VIII, and Julius Caesar. Charlemagne, <laughs> Henry VIII, and Julius Caesar. Yeah. Well, that's preposterous. <laughs> First of all, we know very little about Charlemagne. How do I know that? I wrote a biography of Charlemagne, and most of the stuff uh, it's, we don't know very much. Now, Henry VIII, well, he did have a number of wives. That, and he took care of them <laughs> by executing them. So there's an analogy with Henry VIII. And <laughs> What was the other one? Julius Caesar. I don't see, I don't see the, no, I don't see that. But Bannon just says things to provoke. That's part of uh, that news service he has. It's the titillation, provocation, with no, no follow through, no substance. Profanation. Okay, so um, you talked about you would have been president, you know, if you'd gotten married earlier, but I've always been curious that um, you know, you had to deal with the long shadow of your father, and I feel like you spent a long time, you know, being this great rebel, and you know, you weren't interested in any of that old school politics. And 
I just wondered if you had sort of combined your rebel side and his Irish Catholic charming side sooner. Would that have been, I feel you did do that in the end and it worked great. Do you regret that it took so long? Well, uh, first of all, I don't know that my father, well, yeah, I guess he did have a long shadow because I was able to get elected four years after his defeat uh, to Ronald Reagan in 1966. I was elected Secretary of State in 1970. And that was obviously because my name was Edmund G. Brown Jr. So that shadow was quite, I, I would say that was a streak of sunlight moving in my direction. Um, but also my father uh, it was at a different time. Uh, he uh, was leaving office uh, about the time the Vietnam War was heating up. Uh, the word environment was barely uttered. They used words like conservation, a conservationist, but we didn't have environmentalism. Earth Day hadn't happened. We didn't have the Clean Air Act. We didn't have the, uh, uh, the NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act. Uh, we didn't have a lot of those things that uh, brought to bear a whole new dimension of politics and divided democratic uh, environmentalists from democratic building trades and uh, carpenters and operating engineers. We also didn't have the failure of Vietnam, um, that, that massive application of men and material and money uh, failing. Uh, we didn't have uh, uh, the Watergate, uh, the, the resignation of a president. We didn't have the assassination of, uh, of Bobby Kennedy uh, or Martin Luther King. There was a lot between the end of my father's administration and the beginning of, of my administration, which was eight years later, a lot of change in the world that raised skepticism. A lot of um, academics were writing articles like nothing works uh, in regard to prisons, attacking rehabilitation. Also uh, questioning whether what education did uh, to reduce inequality. So there, there was a lot of, oh, arms agreements can't work. There was a lot of intellectual work that, um, that paralleled the skepticism and the loss of confidence. In fact, if you go back to the time of uh, Jack Kennedy uh, and you ask what the, the trust level in government, it's in the 70s. And it didn't take too many decades to move that into the, into the 30s and 40s. In fact, for the Congress, it's uh, like 15. It's barely double digits. So the world changed. And so I presented myself in a more, hopefully more authentic, uh, but taking uh, cognizance of this more skeptical, um, kind of di disillusioned uh, mood among the voters. And so I think that defined the way I presented myself and the way <coughs> my father was kind of um, going along in a certain way, but that way had been very discredited, and not really for anything he did, but for the whole business of, of the war, the recession, the Arab oil embargo, impeachment, all the rest of it. What, what was your family dinner table like when you were growing up? That must have been amazing. My family dinner table, well, my father, very, uh, he was elected district attorney uh, when I was five. I, I was in kindergarten at the time. And um, so we would, uh, we had uh, one phone, you didn't have a phone in every room in those days. And his phone would always ring at dinner time and somebody wanted to, the district attorney to do something. And he was in charge of, of a certain social, social welfare, family law. So there'd be a lot of calls uh, about his job as attorney, uh, district attorney. Um, there was also certainly campaigning. There were labor officials. There were campaign donors. Um, in that campaign, uh, Gavin Newsom's grandfather had uh, been a major financial backer of my father. And so I got very familiar uh, with the politics of labor, of money, of campaigning, and all of that, uh, which I didn't find very interesting. In fact, I found it so uh, uninteresting that I entered the seminary uh, several years later to uh, try a different, totally different path. But we did have a lot of talks, a lot of verbal exchange of free, uh, the dinner table was a place of conversation. And we did have a dinner at a certain hour. Uh, I always wanted it earlier, but we always <laughs> sat at the table and we talked. My father talked a lot, um, but so did we all. And we all kind of 
talked, it was pretty, um, what would I say, open. And uh, so that was good. So maybe that's why I learned to talk. Um, I'd like to tell the audience. Oh, also, I wanted to say something about the dinner table and beyond. I've thought about this, and people have a hard time in school and things. I don't believe I ever heard growing up an incorrect English sentence or phrase ever uttered. Because my wow. parents spoke good, clear English, and we were never allowed to deviate, not an ant or this or that, a or ain't rather. So I think that was uh, another characteristic of growing up. One of the benefits of a, of a nice, solid, middle-class bearing where, where you get the fundamentals before you even get into the classroom. They're already there, so. That's great. Good um, syntax. Good syntax, yeah. We work on that in my office. Um, I'd like to tell the audience about a really cool moment we had together in 2011 in Los Angeles where you were telling me that Anne had nothing to wear to an Oscar lunch at the Beverly Hills mansion of Diane von Furstenberg and Barry Diller. So you swept her into D Dion's store that day to buy her three frocks. And you talked about how you conspired with Dion, who is an old friend of yours, to design your wife's wedding dress. I'm always impressed with men who buy women clothes, especially because in the 70s, sometimes you were known for showing up with mismatched shoes. No, that's a myth. <laughs> that's a myth. So you told me... Maybe mismatched socks. <laughs> Once or twice. Never shoes. That is really a doofus. So... You told me you like elegance, classic, not too flamboyant, with colors. So yeah, I do. Well, I do. I like expensive clothes and expensive jewelry on women. Yes, I do. There you go. So, not, Plus, not so much beauty. of an ascetic anymore. It's all about beauty. Yeah. Um, so he, uh, Governor Brown was reading over my and shoulder. And I did pick out the wedding dress, and I did call. Uh, and didn't even want a wedding, but I did. Uh, I mean, a wedding, you know, ceremony. So I called up Dion, and uh, she designed the dress, and that was good. And um, I picked out the wedding ring as well, and it's a hell of a wedding ring. <laughs> the engagement ring. I it just, sparkles. <laughs> I just found all that shockingly romantic. Yeah, who knew? Um, <laughs> Um, all right, you were cheating and reading this over my shoulder, no. and he saw Linda Ronstadt's name, and he's like, do not ask a Linda Ronstadt question, or my wife will throw a bottle of water at you. <coughs> but, um, but <laughs> um, she spoke fondly of you at a public appearance this year, saying, he often shows up at my house at Thanksgiving, just as you start carving the turkey, he starts talking about something like fracking. <laughs> so you guys keep in touch. Yeah. But I see that's not uh, perfectly accurate. I think she raised the topic of fracking. I wouldn't raise it otherwise. <laughs> but yeah, well, she, yeah, she's in San Francisco. So when I'm there, uh, we, I, we often stop by. Um, I am, I'm often reminded of your asceticism, your Jesuit Buddhist outlook, your disdain for materialism when I look at the 24 karat lifestyle of our president. What do you make of the new gilded age that Trump has ushered in with tax cuts for the 1% and cabinet secretaries going on crazy spending well, sprees? Well, I, I think it's like the gilded age in the 20s. And that was followed, of course, by a depression, but we already had a great recession. Um, I, it's hard to tell what, what's causing this uh, massive redistribution of wealth upward, making the rewards for the few who really succeed ever greater and greater, and the punishments um, for those who don't succeed so well, uh, greater, uh, more intense too. And it's happening not just in California or the US, but across the whole world. And there's something about this stage in capitalism uh, maybe through the automation, the information, um, giving so much power in the hands of the few. Uh, but there is a growing uh, stratification. And so, uh, yeah, Trump, uh, that tax cut, uh, 
Bob Rubin told me, the former Secretary of the Treasury, certainly no great leftist, said it was the worst piece of legislation he'd ever seen. So it's compounding our problems. But the Republicans all went along and voted for it. So Trump is more of a symptom than a cause. And he's floating on this very polarized society, and he temporarily he's been able to exploit it. Um, but what I think about it is, uh, how do you reverse that? And uh, it's not going to be easy, because it's structural. People feel that if you're working at a, one of these big banks, you're worth 20 million. If you're a governor of California, you're worth less than 200 grand. Or say the governor of, of New York. Uh, why is that? Uh, the director of finance in California uh, up until year, makes 195, now I think he makes 200,000. Um, responsible for a $200 billion budget. And they have no shortage of talent. We have great finance directors. I'm not saying that Jamie Dimon ought to make 200,000, but I don't think he should be making 25 or 40 or 50 million, which is more in a couple of seconds than his employees. See, you sound like AOC. Well, that could yeah. be. Uh, that's, yeah, there's some resonance there. So Out of the mouth of babes comes <laughs> wisdom. <laughs> By the way, that's what Jesus said that, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you were leery about legalizing pot. What? Um, I wondered. Why? No. I know why, because you thought everyone would get stoned and not work. Um, but how yeah, do you... I, I, my vision is just America all just sitting back there taking a drag. And <laughs> the Chinese working. I was, in, I, I was over there in China, and I looked out the window. It's 12 o'clock at night, and these people are all working on the scaffolds up 20 or 30 stories on a building. They never stop. I said, well, my god. And the Americans would be all stoned by this time. So, no, I thought we needed a little more uh, focus on the task at hand. But do you uh, do you feel the same now that you see how it's working and it's, the revenues it's early. aren't what it's was early. projected? What the revenues aren't what was projected? Well, we knew there wasn't going to be any money. This is purely for pleasure. Legalizing pot is about getting stoned. Nothing else. Nothing more. Maybe a little medicinal for your. Or whatever it works, I think there's a couple of little diseases that get help with marijuana, but not too many. Um, what do you think about Silicon Valley? Because uh, you know, we this year it has turned into a much darker force. And Why is it a dark force? Well, the election meddling and their stalling about helping uh, figure that the out. The election and, meddling. That's a and good people question. also are. You know, all these books are being written by the founders of Sil a lot of the founders of Silicon Valley, saying, "Turn off your social media. Don't let your kids do it." It's just not. A, a, well, a, because everything has a, it goes in a certain direction, then you hit a problem, and you pull back, and then you advance again. So, yeah, it's been very successful. It's generated a huge amount of wealth, uh, driven up the proper home values, the property prices, made all these millionaires. Uh, and then you have all this media uh, information flowing around. So there are, are issues, but it's been very much, uh, since I was governor in eight years, the economy of California uh, went from 2 trillion to 2.75 trillion, which is a lot bigger than Russia, I might say. We all talk about Russia. <laughs> California is a bigger economic engine. Actually, more than, uh, more than France and more than, more than Great Britain, more than India. But, so a lot of that Silicon Valley and all those problems. So we got a lot of the good, but no good is ever completely good. And so now we're going to have to deal with the automation, the unemployment. Uh, in fact, I was talking to a, a fellow Jesuit priest who was in the seminary with me. He's been running a parish for 40 years in Honduras. I hadn't talked to him 40 years. I got his phone number and called him. And I said, well, what's going on down there? He said, well, a caravan of 1,000 people just left uh, for, for the border. I said, why is this happening? He said, there are no jobs. He said, even here, automation. So yeah, the Silicon Valley is part of a technological um, revolution change that uh, public policy is going to have to deal with. And some of our candidates, I'd like to hear them. If we could avoid nuclear war and climate change and cyber attack on our command and control systems and all other infrastructure, we ought to worry about this inequality and, and uh, also the whole banking system is tied into that uh, information system. So there's a lot of vulnerability in the midst of a lot of wealth and success. 
How do you think Gavin Newsom is doing so far? Is he spending too much money? He hasn't had a chance to yet because the budget isn't signed until July. Are you worried so, he's going to So, so far, so much? good. <laughs> well, it was one little problem. Uh, see, politics is about timing. Uh, if your timing's bad, my timing was exquisite. I was elected, I ran for office the, at the end of the recession as the recovery was beginning. And so for eight years, the uh, economy of California kept going up. We went from over 12% unemployment to 4.1% unemployment. Created over 3 million jobs. We, the whole complicated system, including Silicon Valley, playing a major role. So the system goes up, but we know what goes up comes down. That's the law of gravity. And the law of uh, financial gravity in a capitalist system is uh, this up and the down. And the California tax system, it generates tremendous money. Arnold at one time had a $60 billion deficit. He whittled it down $60 billion. He it whittled down, or he did, or the economy, to $27 billion when I talk, took it over. Now we have a $30 billion combined surplus and reserve. But we're at the, now that was good. I'll, uh, uh, that was good, and I can take some responsibility because I spend uh, very reluctantly and hopefully wisely. But uh, we're in the 10th year of the recovery, the longest recovery in history went 10 years. So usually people feel very exuberant uh, about the time the recovery is about to end. And when they end, they often end with a crash because of our uh, tax structure California will lose in a moderate recession 50 to 60 billion over three years. So the, tr the time to be cautious is when everything looks great. And I've been saying, watch out, watch out. But then it sounds like you're crying in the wilderness because it looks so good. And so people have to experience. Uh, and that, that's where we are. I think the economy will decline. But I think he's a resilient politician. And uh, I'm, I'm reasonably hopeful. So the clock has run out of time, which is the perfect metaphor to address our last question about the doomsday clock running out of time. Well, the doomsday clock, by the way, is not, it's just a metaphor. It, uh, it was, it's set up by the Bolton of Atomic Scientists, <coughs> and they set the hands of the clock uh, based on the danger <coughs> that this group of scientists uh, perceive in the world. Uh, the Bolton of Atomic Scientists, which I'm now the executive chairman, uh, was started by Albert Einstein and other creators of the, of the atomic bomb. And they wanted to, I remember uh, Einstein said, everything has changed utterly except the way we think because of the existence the, uh, of the atomic bomb. So anyway, this group looks at it. Now, at now it is 2.2 minutes to midnight. The last time it was that way um, was 1953. 53, the Russians were expected to go through Berlin the Russians had just set off a hydrogen bomb. We're in the midst of the Cold War. So these nuclear scientists think we're at that danger. Not a danger that the Russians are going to send a bolt out of the blue, but the blunder. We have very complicated electronic systems, and the Russian systems aren't that good. And in the last uh, 35 years, there have been five instances where the presidents of the two countries have been reported to that a missile, missiles were headed from Russia to the US or uh, uh, America to Russia. In fact, Bill Perry was woken up when he was Assistant Secretary of Defense in the Clinton administration, and he was told by somebody out there at Strategic Air Command that 200 Russian missiles are headed our way. But the, uh, luckily, the man who said that, I, I think maybe there's a mistake here. Well, because there was a calm sense with Russia, it seemed very implausible. As the tension level goes up, a blunder becomes quite plausible. Blunder by political miscalculation or mistake, or by some kind of technical glitch, or more horrible, uh, if some cyber intervention in our command and control. Suffice it to say, this is serious stuff. It's not news. It's not on the campaign trail. We're only going to spend a minute on it. But it's still damn serious. And the clock is set based on the nuclear threat and climate change. And on both scores, human beings have created enough power 
uh, that it's questionable how we're going to how we're going to control it. And I like to see it as a, as a, as graph it. If you graph the power that humankind has created, that, that graph would go up straight. More and more power for good and for utter destruction. Now he said, let's have a graph of the wisdom and the sense of restraint, and that's completely flat. So we got one curve going up, one curve totally flat. It's getting, the gap's getting bigger and bigger. So that's why I say the issue is very important. It's not something we talk about. It's not exciting. It's not taxes. It's not me too. It's not uh, whatever, but it's damn important, and that's why I'm going to devote uh, the next several years to doing whatever I can to minimize climate change and to get Russia and the U.S. talking about the biggest topic of all, and that is, can human civilization survive with all this power? Where are we going to get the wisdom to control it? So. I just, hi, I just want to thank you guys and thank Governor Brown and say that my Republican sister is here and she lived in California in the 70s when you were governor and she liked you so much that she says she will not vote for Trump and she'll vote for you if you want. Okay, great. So think about it. All right, it. got one vote. <laughs>